Science with a Twist and Strain. Very much looking forward to your talk. Okay. So uh, good morning and uh, thanks the organizers for the invitation. Um, the ability to isolate atomically thin, thin layers has made it possible for us to engineer uh, band structures, to change the Fermi energy in the system. And it has opened an enormous vista of possibilities for creating uh, uh, correlated states by, for example, creating flat bands as we discussed here and bringing the Fermi energy into the flat band and then watch new the emergence of correlated states uh, that have possibly interesting uh, topology. So what I'm gonna tell you about is, uh, I'm gonna start with an experimentalist understanding of flat bands. Uh, and I'm gonna put that in a context of Landau levels. Uh, and then I'm gonna give a very quick introduction to graphene. And then I'm gonna discuss two cases of engineering flat bands. One is in twisted bilayer graphene. And there I will ask a question. We know that we have superconductivity in twisted bilayer graphene at the magic angle, but I'm gonna ask the question, is the flat band also topological? And can we say, can we, can we uh, observe that experimentally? Uh, and uh, in the second part of the talk, I'm gonna introduce another way of creating flat band by using strain if I get there. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Um, okay, so let's get started with the most important people here. Uh, so the pictures here are of postdocs and students uh, or uh, former postdocs who've done all the work at Rutgers. In red here, we have our theoretical collaborators. Uh, this is the team of Andre Geim who, who provide graphene on iodine diselenide where we did the work on strain uh, and, the, uh, and the Japanese group that provided the boron nitride. So let me get started. Of course, the reason that we are also interested in flat bands is that you have the kinetic energy is quenched. And when you're able to bring your Fermi energy into the flat band, uh, you have enhanced correlation effects and it give rise to a whole slew of possible correlated states. Uh, so the, some of the most interesting one for, the, for this discussion here is superconductivity. So we all know very well that the conventional superconductor, the BCS theory, the pairing, uh, the pairing electrons live in a very thin sliver uh, on the Fermi C uh, and the TC as we've seen already many times is exponentially suppressed here uh, in the pairing energy and density of states. So the traditional way of increasing TC is uh, to increase the density of state, uh, for example, uh, usually by chemical doping for, for in graphite, you do cal your calcium intercalation and you can bring TC up to a few, a few Kelvin, sorry about this. Uh, and uh, in uh, transition metal dichalconogite, uh, you can use ionic liquid doping uh, and people have observed uh, TC superconductivity with TC as high as 15 Kelvin. So is there another, an alternative to that? And that was proposed in the 90s by this mostly Finnish group. And what they show that alternative approach to increasing TC is to create flat bands. And then because of diverging, you get a diverging density of state of the Fermi energy. Uh, and uh, what is very interesting about that the, the pairing spans the entire Fermi C in this case. Uh, and uh, what Volovic showed is that, and, uh, and his collaborator, that in this case, TC is not exponentially suppressed, but it's linear in the pairing uh, energy uh, times the area of the flat band or volume of the flat band within the Brillouin zone. And these are pretty very interesting and intriguing predictions. Uh, in 2007, in fact, the Volovic predicted that you could get a uh, room temperature superconductivity in graphite due to in the presence of screw dislocations. Uh, uh, and of course, there's a big question whether that, that is possible. Uh, so, however, the caveat about all this, and we've heard it uh, just now from Deban John and yesterday from uh, Andre uh, uh, Bernavig, uh, is that even though 
the pairing is ha can happen at very high temperatures unless the superfluid stiffness is finite it's completely useless and if you have a single band isolated band uh, in the ginzburg landau sense of course uh, the stu superfluid stiffness go is going to go to zero be because the mass diverges so in uh, 2015, uh, this Finnish group uh, found a way around this, and they pointed out that if you have a non-trivial uh, geometry of the wave function, uh, then you actually have a lower band on the, which is determined a geometrical bound of the superfluid stiffness. And they found that the, this geometrical bound proves a lower bound, which is proportional to the churn number here. Uh, however, Subsequent work show first that, in fact, you don't need a finite churn number. All you need is a, a finite Berry curvature. And more recently, all you need is a, a non trivial, you need a, a quantum geometry. So they, they, this condition has been relaxed quite dramatically. Um, so um, so in fact, so the bottom line is not only do we need flat bands, but we want some kind of non-trivial topology. Experimentally, what we can measure is the churn number. We cannot measure the metric or anything else. So we're going to be looking to whether those flat bands have a finite churn number. So now let me do a little bit of a detour uh, for the students uh, on graphene. So, uh, and you've heard that the lecture on, on Monday in the tutorial. So uh, this is the uh, crystal structure of graphene. It has uh, two sublattices, A and B. The ingredients for the, for the band structure are very simple here, two-dimensional honeycomb structure and identical atoms on the two lattices. This gives rise at the low energy to uh, this very simple Hamiltonian here, you have uh, uh, two uh, Dirac cones, the lower excitation are described by two Dirac cones, which are related, which are, uh, each of them is chiral and they're correlated by time reversal symmetry. And that gives a density of state which is linear and vanishes here at the Dirac point. Uh, experimentally, the fact, uh, and this is where uh, uh, charge neutrality sits. So experimentally, the fact that density of state vanishes makes it possible with relatively small gate voltage to, uh, to walk around here and to change the Fermi energy almost as will in this kind of a geometry about uh, a one volt in gate voltage by view uh, 10 to the uh, about 10 to the 11th carrier per centimeter square or it changes the Fermi energy by 30 millivolts. Uh, now, if you add a magnetic field, uh, you had to have a gauge, uh, a gauge field here, and that gives rise to Landau levels, uh, which in this case are go like the square root of the magnetic field times the, the Landau level index. And what's interesting here and most interesting for the discussion today is the n equals zero Landau level, uh, which actually, if you if you look here, it, it's made up of both electrons and holes. Uh, the if you if you park your Fermi energy in between uh, the zeros and any an equal one level, uh, you find that there's there's no quantum hole effect. Your number is zero, and it's going to stay zero unless you uh, you uh, remove this degeneracy either by spin or by value. Uh, okay. Now experimentally, what we do is uh, we measure. Uh, uh, in this case is scanning tunneling microscopy. Uh, in scanning tunneling microscopy, we measure the tunneling current, uh, which here, this integral here is, goes from the Fermi energy to the bias voltage that we apply. Rho here is the density of state, and this is exponential factor comes from the, the matrix element. Uh, and so that allows us to do two kinds of measurements. One is what we call uh, topography, uh, so we we keep the current the current constant, the bias constant, uh, and we raster the sample so we can see where the atoms are sitting. Uh, another measurement that we can do with STM is take the derivative of the density, the IDV, and that extract the density of state here as a function of energy, which is controlled with the bias voltage. So this is what you see, what it looks like in graphene. This is graphene on graphite. And when you apply magnetic field, uh, you see the Landau levels pop up, uh, and there's a lot of information that you can extract, in particular, the Fermi velocity from this sequence here, life 
quasi-particle lifetimes on the line width, coupling to the substrate, etc. So there's a lot of information that we can extract from here. Um, and uh, so, uh, so basically, Landau levels are the quintessential flat band with non-trivial topology. Um, so, for example, if you park your your uh, Fermi energy here, you can see uh, the the, qu uh, the quantum hole effect, which can basically measure directly uh, the uh, churn number. Basically, this is the number of edge states that you have in your system. Uh, if you park your, your Fermi energy in one of these Landau levels, you can see fractional quantum hole effect. That is uh, the emergence of interacting state. However, the problem is that, uh, you know, we have to apply a magnetic field here. So the question is, can we create flat bands without breaking time reversal symmetry? And there are, I know of three ways of doing it. Uh, one is the magic angle twisted graphene. So you take two graphene layers, superpose them, and uh, you have a certain angle where the band flattens here. That is a kind of a resonance effect. That is when the interlayer and intralayer hopping are comparable to each other. This is not a trivial flat band that you would get by just putting the system in a, in a periodic potential. Uh, so I'm going to be discussing this. The other way of doing it is apply periodic strain that creates a pseudomagnetic field which doesn't break time reversal symmetry but acts exactly like a magnetic field in the sense that it gives you these pseudo landau levels flat bands uh, and by bringing the fermi energy into one of them you can hope to to uh, 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 to create uh, non-trivial correlated states uh, the third way, which I'm not going to discuss, but Andre Bernovic discussed it yesterday, is by bipartite lattices and their line graph partners. Uh, and these are a few examples. And these have naturally symmetry protected chiral flat bands. In this case here, for example, the lib band. Uh, and this is, these are very interesting systems that have not yet been really fully explored experimentally. Uh, okay, so let me go to twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, so you've seen this probably many, many times. You bring the bring the green layer on top of the red and twist it, and you you don't create a super uh, period here, which is uh, inversely proportional to the twist angle. But something that not many people maybe realize is that when you shift it, when you shift the two layers, this is what happens. Uh, you see the pattern remains the same. The only thing that happens, you change the origin. Okay, so the pattern, the translation, the pattern shifts, but nothing very interesting happening. You will see that you have Bohr nitride present. The story is totally different. Uh, so if, if the two lattices have different uh, lattice mismatch, of course, this period is a little bit more complicated and there is a lower bound on the size of your, your Moiré cell. Uh, so this is the, so moiré patterns have been macroscopic moiré patterns have been known for hundreds of years in the textile industry. Uh, it, the at the nano level, microscop atomic uh, moiré uh, patterns have only been discovered with the invention of the STM. So that's when they were first observed. When people, the first thing that people looked at when they uh, built the first STM was to look at graphite and they saw these moiré patterns. But what they did not realize, and then you see here, as you decrease the twist angle, the period gets larger and larger. But what people didn't realize for quite a long time is that and not only does it generate pretty patterns, but this periodic moiré also changes the band structure. So as you decrease the, the, the twist angle, you see the band structure changes. You see the appearance of Van Hoff singularities that get closer and closer together as you decrease the, the twist angle. Uh, and this is here 1.8 degrees, and then you go to 1.1 degrees and the two merge. Another thing that you see that the at the Fermi energy, you open a small gap here, which is kind of a hint that you might have correlated states. Um, so here is the, the, the gap between the Van Hoff singularities. Uh, and, uh, and you see here that it merges at a finite twist angle, which is, which is quite a surprising at the time. And 
another thing that you see, you can measure the Fermi velocity as a function of twist angle by me measuring the by from lambda level spectroscopy. And you see that it tends to decrease and maybe tends to zero right at the magic angle. So that is another signature of the flat man. Yes. Uh, on the previous slide, uh, how accurately is it possible to measure uh, uh, near one degree? How accurately? It very accurately because we, we when we look at the Fourier transform, uh, we can measure it within a fraction of a degree. No, I, I meant. Uh, uh, that you mean the twist angle, right? Very accurately. Right, so you but you go to reciprocal, you go to the Fourier transform, you compare the uh, the Bragg peaks from the atomic lattice to the Bragg peaks of the, the twisted of the Moiré pattern, and you can see exactly. And then it's of course going to depend how large the area that you look at, but we are pretty accurate, and much more accurate than we can actually control the twist. Andre, what's the minimum distance between one hole? Um, so they repeat for so well, here, well they they we see them merging but at this point here uh, we you see the fermi energy is here and there is a little gap right at the fermi energy so you know the mi minimum distance is our resolution which in this case was not very great it was like five millivolts but in i'm looking at Maybe, the lower no, no, plot. two millivolts what I'm looking at the lower plot when you should put, uh, I guess this is the distance between one half points as a function of the angle. Right, right, right. So I'm asking about the lowest points that you have because the so vertical scale is in electron. The, the lowest so. point that, and I, okay, the error bars are pretty large. This gives you an idea of the error bars. They go down as you go here. I, I took them out, but uh, you know, it is, uh, I don't know, 0. 0.1 degree or so. You mean in, in it twist distance and energy. Energy. energy? It's about five millivolts. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, uh, in order to understand what's going on, let's go to reciprocal space. Um, and here we have uh, the Dirac cones of the two layers, red and green. Uh, and you see that there, the distance between adjacent red and green Dirac cones in, uh, in, in one of the K valleys is proportional to the twist angle that gives rise to this. This spans the mini Brillouin zone here. And because each one of them uh, is uh, descendant from a particular K valley, they have opposite chiralities. And now we have too many Brillouin zone with opposite chiral, eight orbitals per Moiré cell, two from valley, two from layer, two from spin. Uh, so now let's go back and look at this Hamiltonian. This is Hamiltonian in one particular K valley, and we're looking at these two uh, Dirac cones, and you see that if there is tunneling between the two layers, uh, which means that you have off diagonal term here, then the intersection point between the two cones uh, goes down and creates a, a saddle point. Uh, and that by T perp here is the, it, it, the interlayer tunneling. And it creates, so as we know, a saddle point in the, the uh, band structure gives rise to Van Hoff singularities in density of state, a logarithmic divergence basically in the density of states. Uh, and at the magic angle, and you see, as you decrease the, uh, the twist angle, eventually you get to an angle, which is the ratio of the interlayer to intralayer tunneling, uh, which is about at one degree. Uh, and this is just an illustration of how the flat band is created. This is work from the Caxiris group. And you see, as you decrease the twist angle, uh, you the band closes here, and eventually, when you go to 1.1, you get you know, a perfectly flat band. The problem is that if you look at this, there's no gap to the remote band. So it, it, there's nothing interesting going to happen. You need a gap to the remote bands for something interesting to ha happen. And here is where uh, nature is kind to us. 
Uh, and, and let me show you what happens act to, to open a gap there. So here is again the moiré cell, the bright, uh, the, the bright regions here correspond to what we call AA stacking, where every atom in the top layer eclipses an atom in the bottom layer. Uh, the red, uh, the darker regions correspond to AB or BA stacking, uh, where in one case the, a, the uh, atoms in the A sub lattice eclipse uh, atoms in the B sub lattice in the bottom layer, and uh, vice versa, versa for BA. Now there is something uh, we can plot something that we call registry index, uh, which is the extent of which the top layer uh, obstructs, the top layer atom obstructs the bottom layer atom. And you, if you have a rigid lattice, the, the AA regions and AB regions have roughly the same size. However, if we look at the energetics of stacking, you see that the AA stacking is much, much more expensive. It's like 12, it's about 20 millivolt per atom more expensive than AB stacking. So the system really doesn't like to be in the AA stacking. And because this is an atomically thin layer, it can really readjust to reduce the size of the AA layers. So this is how, for example, at 0.3 degrees, the registry index looks like this. So the AA regions have shrunk to, a, to basically 10% of the moiré cell. Experimentally, we see that uh, as well. This is 0.28 degree. The AA regions are the bright ones here, ABBA, and they're separated by domain walls. Uh, now, in order for this to happen, you need a lot of built-in strain in your, in your system. And how does that happen? It happens actually in a very interesting way. Every atom uh, here, I don't know if you can see the arrows, is kind of shifted a little bit in the moiré cell, and they form kind of uh, vortices that are in one sense, you have a vortex lattice that is sitting on this uh, uh, moiré. It actually has opposite vorticity in the uh, top and bottom layer. Very interesting phenomenon. Uh, okay, and this uh, reconstruction, this is what gives rise to a gap. Uh, so now, because of the reconstruction, we have a nice gap between uh, the flat band here and the remote bands, and that's what allows us to do all this uh, interesting flat band physics. Uh, so, uh, so bottom line, in magic angle twisted by layer graphene, we have an isolated flat band. Uh, it's eightfold degeneracy, the degeneracy protected by C2T symmetry, inversion times time reversal, and the band filling is controlled by the electrostatic gating. So by gating the sample, we can move the Fermi energy within this system. Uh, and there is a way of, for us, this is the way we count it. Other people count some were different, but I think this is a good way of counting uh, the filling. So N naught is one carrier per more cell. So N equals to zero is charge neutrality. Uh, electron sector is positive uh, N over N naught uh, and, uh, and holes is uh, negative N over N naught. And minus four here would be an empty band, plus four would be a full band. Um, okay, so since, uh, you know, back in 2010, when we did our experiment on suspended graphene layers, uh, we didn't have much control of a twist angle. What we did have was CVD graphene that had all the possible twist angles in the sample. So you could just uh, walk on our sample and look at different angles. But there were several important uh, technical developments in the intervening years. First, uh, Corey, uh, Corey Dean et al. and Jim Hohn's group uh, discovered that boron nitride is a very good substrate. Uh, if you don't uh, align it with that, they didn't know that it was the graphene. And uh, this enabled the observation of fractional quantum Hall effect without actually suspending the sample, which we had to do. Uh, the second development was the ability to perfectly control the twist angle. This was developed by Manuel Tutuk. And using these techniques, a group of uh, uh, Pablo Jaria Hilero at MIT were able to create this uh, device, graph, twisted by layer graphene is sitting here. They had a hole bar here. And that, uh, you know, uh, they observed superconductivity, but it created an avalanche of both theoretical and experimental papers. And this is, I'm listing uh, the, just the highlights, uh, churn insulator, superconductivity, pseudo gap phase, pneumatic charge order, orbital magnetism, 
Planckian dissipation, the fractional turn insulator, all this observed in this one system. Uh, and this is a subset of the many, many papers that, that have uh, uh, done that. So I'm gonna ask now the question, is, are these, this, is this flat band also uh, has some non-trivial topology? I can't measure the quantum metric, but I can measure Chern number. Uh, okay, for that, I'm, there's one more theoretical thing here. Uh, let's go back to the Hamiltonian here. So this is the Hamiltonian in the, in the layer base. So top uh, in red, we have layer one, in green, we have layer two. And there's something very interesting that happens when you change bases, when you go from layer bases to sublattice bases. Uh, and if you do that, what emerges is a kind of, it's a gate field. It's a, and you see here A and plus A, this is only in the K Valley. So on the A sub lattice, you have the, 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 the gauge field has a positive side on the B sub lattice, a negative side. Bottom line, it looks like a magnetic field, except you haven't broken time reversal symmetry, right? So uh, it, it looks like a magnetic field. It should act like a magnetic field. If you take the curl of that thing, you can estimate it's kind of 120 Tesla. This is a rough estimate. And uh, if you have a pseudomagnetic field, then of course, the first thing that you, you know, you're gonna get lambda, pseudo lambda level. These are pseudo lambda levels because they, you haven't broken time reversal symmetry. And uh, this is in the K Valley. So you see sublattice A in red, sublattice B in blue. And if you look at, in the Moiré cell, you're gonna have a magnetic field pointing up on sublattice A, magnetic field pointing down on sublattice B. This looks like almost a Haldane Hamiltonian. Um, it, it comes from going, it, it's, it, it's inherent in this structure here. Uh, you just do it, you, you just do a, a change of basis to the sublattice basis. No, the strain is not included here. What do you need to do about it? Uh, no, there is a U here. This is the, of course, the interlayer tunneling. That is when you do the transformation, it's buried in here. And the zero here is kind of because it's, it's tunneling between the A, B sublattice, and that can be neglected for the N equals zero level. Yes? Uh, no, no, not at all. You're going to see in a moment what it looks like. You know, it's kind of, uh, okay. Uh, now, if I add to that the K prime valley, of course, it's time reversal symmetric, then it's going to look like this. So you have the K and K prime valley. And now we have this flat band, which is just the equivalent of the N equals zero lambda level. Uh, N equals zero pseudo lambda level, eightfold degeneracy protected by C2T symmetry. So unless you break one of these symmetries, you're not gonna see anything uh, uh, that has to do with topology. Uh, okay, so, so here we have again, the pseudomagnetic field induced by Moiré potential. We have, uh, we can describe these, uh, uh, the wave vector in, in two ways. One is what, we, what I call the churn basis. So you put on the left, everything that have churn number plus one or field up on the right, everything that is churn number minus one. And then on the left, we have K valley on sublattice A, K prime valley sublattice V and vice versa. You can also now, whether you use this basis or, so for example, when I'm having a filling of three, uh, I have all these states filled except for one uh, with uh, minus one here, for example. And, uh, but this is not gonna make any difference unless you really break the symmetry because you're gonna fill these seven states in different regions of the sample, they're gonna be all over. So you're not gonna recover uh, and un cover the symmetry unless, unless you break, break some of the symmetries. And I'm gonna get into that, uh, to that into a moment. The other possibility is look at a sublattice basis. So you separate A on the left and B on the right. So in A, we have K and K prime value, chair number plus one, minus one, and vice versa here. In a moment, you see why I'm talking about this. 
Now, if you look in real space, in the real moiré cell, and that goes back to your question here, uh, that this, this pseudomagnetic field creates this chiral current that counter-propagating diamagnetic current loops uh, on the AB and BA regions alternating here with opposite sign pseudomagnetic fields. So depending on how you fill your states, you might discover this uh, orbital magnetism. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see how we can break the symmetry. So first, let's see how we can break the C2Z symmetry, the inversion symmetry. We put the sample on a staggered potential. In this case, we have to perfectly align it with the boron nitride substrate. Uh, and uh, let's fill it to, to a filling of... So now what happened, the A sub lattice is lower in energy than the B sub lattice. So when I start throwing in electrons, they're going to first go in here, and only once this is filled, they're going to go up here. So for example, when I'm at the filling of three, this is what it's going to look like. The, the last electron, let's say, goes here. We have a hole that has, it's, it has both, uh, well, it's both valley polarized, spin polarized, and sub lattice polarized, okay? Uh, yes? Yes. The alignment with the boron nitride is the whole thing is aligned. So, which depending on okay, boron nitride has two atoms, right? So the boron, depending on the sublat, the sublatin on the boron is going to stay lower than the sublatin on the nitrogen. So they have different energies. So that's how I break it. So if you go back to the graphene Hamiltonian, the reason we had. Uh, this uh, this Dirac cones with no gap that the gap was the uh, was that that the, we had exactly the same atoms on the C sub lattice the same potential on the super sub lattices the moment you break that you open a gap. My question is, can you have a only one of the layer of the you only light a lower one. The, the, the higher one is already automatically aligned. I'm going to get to that in detail if I get there. Okay. Uh, okay. So experimentally, people did this, two groups, uh, Goldhaber Gorbin's group and Andrea Young's group, uh, and Andrea Young's group by training the, set, the sample with a magnetic field. So, uh, you know, a quantum Hall effect anomalous quantum Hall effect uh, and with hysteresis here, which is a signature of uh, orbital magnetism. Now, the other way to break the symmetry is to break the time reversal symmetry by applying an external magnetic field. This time you're not breaking the sublattice symmetry, just the time reversal symmetry. And again, for C equal to three, this is gonna look like this. Now I'm looking in the churn basis, not in the sublattice basis. And again, I have one hole here. So the system in the, for the case of three is gonna be valley polarized and sublattice polarized. It should show an anomalous quantum hole effect, uh, which it does. Us. So here is the, uh, the strata formula. So filling of two, we go to precisely quantized state at about three Tesla. Filling of three, it's precisely quantized at seven Tesla or so. So both, you, depending on how you break your symmetry, you can reveal the underlying uh, topology. It's not there unless you break some symmetry. It's not visible unless you break some symmetry. Okay, so let me now focus on this part here, breaking the symmetry with the, with the Bohr nitride. Now, the aligning two graphene layers experimentally, we know how to do it very, very precisely. However, we have no idea how to align the Bohr nitride. So you have a magic angle to bilayer graphene, you put it on your Bohr nitride, you cannot control the angle. Very, very difficult. And why am I saying that? In order to achieve this state, you had to be aligned to within a fraction of a percent of the, of the angles. And let me show you why. Uh, so the condition for that, you have to have commensurability between the Bohr nitride Moiré pattern and the twist TBG Moiré pattern, okay? And here is the condition for commensurability. Uh, we want to have the TBG at the magic angle. Uh, and the, the, so NPQ are three co-prime numbers. So uh, uh, the you anomalous quantum hole expect, uh, expected in a non-trivial case is uh, graphene, graphene is 1.1, graphene Bohr nitride is 0.55, uh, or you can have graphene, graphene 1.1, 1 
graphene boronide prime zero, and that's it. Uh, and there's, there are very tight bounds on that. So let me show you why. So this is my first layer of graphene. I'm bringing up the second layer of graphene and twisting it to 1.1 degree. Okay, and now I'm gonna add the boronitrite underneath. And I'm gonna twist it to 0.55 degrees. And you see, you create a pattern. Now, no matter how hard I try, I can't hit the exact sense, the exact uh, twist angle. And I'm gonna do a shift. Let's say experimentally, I have no control over the shift. Uh, and you've seen that in TBG, the shift doesn't do much. But in it, with TBG on HBN, it completely, it, it's not, it's completely different. Every shift is a little is different. It's very, it's so it's very critical to have both the twist angle right and the alignment right, uh, unless you're at the perfect angle. But uh, what does perfect angle mean? So uh, this is a calculation that was done by, uh, um, uh, by this group here, uh, two groups here, uh, uh, this was Sentil's group and Alan McDonald's group. And Alan McDonald showed that if you are perfectly aligned, you have a sure number of either plus one or minus one that spans the entire sample. If you're just a tiny bit off, uh, and this is a, uh, the, the, the red is sure number plus one, green is minus one, uh, uh, blue is minus one, green is zero. And this is the, the displacement from perfect alignment. And you see that to create uh, uh, regions that are not, you know, you're not uniform here. And unless this red percolates throughout the sample, you're not gonna be able to see anomalous quantum hole effect. So let's see how, how tight those bounds are, yes? Yes. Uh, so, so, so here we have the, the, the you have a lattice mismatch with the boronitrite. Now, when there are, I don't, I haven't tried that. At what point? I haven't tried that. I don't know. Uh, but certainly, when you have a lattice mismatch, uh, it's a mess. Uh, okay. So, how tight is it now? That Andrea uh, Young sample was here, uh, and and you see, this is the region. Uh, you know. T graphene graphene versus T graphene boronide. This is the region that you have where you have to be in order to see anomalous quantum hole effect. You have to align it within a precision of, of a fraction of a percent. Impossible to do it. So we were we were wondering what's going on. Either these guys are just unbelievably lucky, or something else may be going on. Okay. So it turns out that something else is going on. And this is what's going on. So we prepared a whole bunch of samples uh, and we looked at them with the uh, STM. Uh, this is 0. 0.46 uh, for TBG, 0.45 for G GBN and so on and so forth. Uh, this is the Fourier transform. And you see immediately that we have two groups here on the left. Uh, we have commensurate because you see that the uh, the Bragg peaks, uh, the vectors are, are beautifully aligned. And in this case here, they're perfectly aligned. On the, on the right hand side, they're much further from being commensurate and indeed they are not commensurate, okay? So, so and, and you can measure the built-in strain and uh, you know, it is not, not negligible because uh, you know, the lattices do readjust to each other. And if I'm looking at 1.03 uh, TBG 0.3 uh, boronitride, this is what the topography looks like, perfectly aligned in the uh, reciprocal lattice here, uh, the Fourier transform. Uh, you see you have beautiful second order peaks and the Bragg vectors here are perfectly aligned. So we have its commensurate. However, if you look at a number, it's really very, very far from the alignment that we that was predicted for rigid lattices. It's really like 50% away. Uh, and still we get perfect commensuration. So we get relaxation and Volodya Falco talked about this. Uh, there is a lot of, when you have these 2D layers, there's a lot of relaxation going on. You cannot assume rigid lattices. Uh, and then you have relaxation, but you also have strain buildup. Now, what does that do? So the, the lattice is gonna try to, to align, it's gonna try, but as it 
aligns is going to build up strain and that's going to grow and grow. Eventually, it's going to give because it competes with the van der Waals energy. So that will create domains. Uh, and here is an example of this sample here. Uh, and here we have uh, three commensurate domains. I'm going to focus on one. Uh, hmm? It depends on how far you are from the, the twist angle. This one is about 300 nanometers. Um, so, so, so one can model this by a frankel kantarova model. I mean, we roughly estimate but we need to do better. We, it would be good to have some theoretical help on that. Um, okay, so this is our commensurate domain. Uh, and here we have a tensile domain wall uh, that, that, you know, it gives. And then we have a hole here, it becomes incommensurate, and then the, the organizing starts over again. So now we're looking at, then we're taking density of state maps across this domain, and we're taking them at different energy, zero millivolt, 40 millivolt, 60 millivolt. This is the domain. So you see the domain here lights up. We have a gap in the bulk the domain lights up. There is a state within the a, a mid gap state in the domain. So we walk from away from the domain into the domain and plot on the vertical. These are uh, the, uh, the spectra uh, as a function of position. And you see a zero millivolt here, 40, 60. We are filling of three. Uh, and you see that we have a mid gap state in the domain wall. Um, and you no, know, this is just preliminary work. Uh, and we, we train the system and we look at, uh, we train the system with 500 millitesla and we observe that there, there is a, a well-defined chirality here. Uh, and that chirality turn uh, is change the sign when we train it with an opposite magnetic field. Okay, five minutes, okay. Okay, so, um, Right, so, so it looks like, first of all, the, the nature helps align these systems and perhaps it's these domains that give rise to the anomalous quantum hole effect. We don't know yet, but it looks pretty promising uh, and we, we still have to do a lot of work for to understand this. Um, okay, uh, I have three more slides and I'm gonna uh, uh, summarize. So it's scorecard for magic angle twisted by layer graphene. It turns out that in our group, only one third of the samples are superconducting. Pablo tells me that they're they are now better than that. But the point is that it's not so easy to get the samples to be superconducting. And uh, one of the reasons, probably the main reasons, is that there's twist angle disorder. No matter what you do, the twist angle changes across your sample. And you can see that with various techniques. And unless the magic angle percolates throughout the whole sample, a transport measurement is not gonna give you superconductivity. Uh, you of course can see it locally, but not globally. The other problem is the PC is never larger than four Kelvin. So unlike what, uh, you know, what, uh, what Volovic predicted, uh, it looks like we're never gonna get above uh, four Kelvin in this system. And uh, one can speculate why. Uh, so going back to Volovic's very simple formula here, uh, you see what enters here is the volume of the flat band in the Brillouin zone. And, uh, and for magic angle graphene, it's only 0.04%, uh, it's tiny. So this factor here kills PC. So unless we can maybe increase this, uh, we can probably not get go much higher. Uh, now, if you look at the formula here, uh, there is a recipe for increasing it, uh, the volume in reciprocal space, because if you make the twist angle uh, larger, the magic twist angle larger, then the volume in reciprocal space is going to increase. How do you make it larger? By increasing the hopping between the layer, okay? And that can be done with pressure, right? So that was done by um, the Columbia group. So they applied pressure and uh, uh, you know, gigapascal, huge amount of pressure. Uh, and indeed they increased the magic uh, angle from 1.1 to 1.27. And they increased TC from an initial, I think two Kelvin to three Kelvin. And not, we're not there yet. 
So, uh, so it looks like this route is not that promising. So one has to find other systems of flat bands where perhaps the volume, first of all, that are less finicky and where the volume is larger. And since I'm at the end of my talk, I'm not gonna tell you what the system is. I'm just gonna give you a hint. Uh, uh, and the hint is uh, twisted bilayer graphene, we have a periodically modulated interlayer hopping. Okay, so what we thought about, okay, what you are, instead of a periodically modulated interlayer hopping, you have a periodically modulator intralayer hopping. And in this case, what happens so that, that you can do that by periodic strain, uh, and that gives you pseudolanda level, which I can't, won't get into, but we can discuss it later. Uh, so here, we can control the strain period, no big deal. Uh, so that controls the mini Brillouin zone area, controls the value, the volume of the Brillouin zone in reciprocal of the flat band reciprocal space. And you can also control its strength uh, by, you know, by the amount of strain that you put in there. And that allows you to control the flatness of the band. And since I'm at the end of my time, let me go to the end, jump here to the end. Nope. Okay, let me jump to the summary. Okay, so uh, summary of what I told you. So basically I only had time to talk, talk about this part. So if you have a partially filled flat band, you can get a whole bunch of different correlated phases. Uh, TVG on HBN aligned uh, the lattice relaxation favors commensurate Moray pattern to a certain extent, uh, unless you're too far away from the commensurate angle. You form domains of commensurate lattices. You have domain walls that host mid gap states, which may be responsible for the quantum anomalous Hall effect. And thank you for your attention. Thanks for a very nice talk. We have time for questions. Uh, just a simple question. Since you are not sure whether domain walls uh, host mid gap states, the, the, the quantum uh, anomalous all effect, have you, have you been able to detween the samples, like to play with the twinning such that somehow you remove these domain walls and see whether transport changes? Uh, so the domain walls are created by the self alignment. And unless you are at the perfect uh, commensurate angle, which is 1.1, for TBG 0.55 for TBG HBN, uh, at that point you should be able to create, uh, uh, you know, get rid of the domain walls. You don't want to get rid of the domain walls, but well, I mean, you, you still going to have the edge of the sample, which is going to give you, uh, you know, if all these ideas are correct, uh, which they probably are, then it is going to give you edge states at the edge of the sample. You're not going to chase them away. So the edge is defined either by the main wall or just by the physical edge of the sample, wherever, whichever is smaller. My opinion. I... Okay, got it. How, how is the domain wall distributed in the sample? Is it uniformly distributed? I know that, oh, that's a whole different story. That's very, very interesting. Uh, so the domain walls, they like to be aligned across some crystallographic axis. Now, but if they're forced to be along another axis, they go like this, they go along the right axis and then they jump and then, uh, and they become much wider. And we have both tensile and shear domains and we are working on writing this up, but this is, you know, a whole different talk, yeah. Thanks. So yeah, uh, about the last part of the strain uh, effect, uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, what is the energy scale? Uh, in the, uh, the experiment they didn't get a chance to talk about compared to uh, magical graphene. Uh, the energy scale of what? For example, the, uh, the flat band and the next band, the remote band, what is the energy gap? Um, uh, well, I, can, I can show you that. So uh, it will depend on, you know, it's pseudo lambda levels, right? If you have a periodic size, pseudo lambda levels. So it's going to depend on the pseudomagnetic field, which depends on the strain. You can tune that. So, you know, it, uh, 
we have about 100 millivolts go between what in, in, the, in this particular sample. If I remember correctly, 100 millivolt, the pseudomagnetic field here is about 120 volt. I mean, here we have pseudomagnetic field, which is about eight volts. So this is graphene on pillars. Yeah. Uh, uh, eight, uh, eight test lines. Yeah. Another quick question is, uh, have you tried a one-dimensional periodic strain field? Uh, you mean tensile strain? Uh, 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 one-dimensional. So you can create a pseudomagnetic field, which is um, periodic varying, uh, but it's in one, dimen one direction, not in the other direction. Um, I see. So, so just have one array of pillars. Yeah, yeah. One uh, we have done that and we looked at it. There's very interesting quantum hole physics there. Uh, and the very, very interesting things going on there. We couldn't understand. We couldn't get anybody to help us understand this. So we never published it, that's but I'll be happy to talk to you about this. Because I think yeah. the energy scale may be even more uh, favorable in that case. I see, I see. Okay. Yeah, uh, if I remember correctly, they see the anomalous quantum hole in the uh, plus three filling, but they don't see at the minus three filling, if I remember correctly. In, That's uh, right. They only yeah. see it at plus three, but now somebody, see, they only see it so at plus one. Now, if there is a strong electron hole asymmetry here. Uh, uh, like, for example, superconductivity is strongest in the whole side. Uh, it looks like uh, this anomalous quantum hole effect. If you break the sublattice symmetry, then uh, the, these samples don't show superconductivity. You know, there's some evidence that they do, but it's probably different domains. So uh, it looks, and, and you know, that might help rule out certain models, but it looks like the uh, uh, breaking inversion symmetry is inimical to superconductivity. Yeah, my question was related to that, that do you have this domain wall kind of a picture in the whole side where they don't see the ferromagnetism? Like, does it help explain that as well? You mean no domain walls? Yeah, like, do you see uh, that in uh, the no, other side? I, nobody's looked at this before. So, you know, there, a lot more work needs to be okay. done to correlate those things. So, okay, for and, example, we haven't done transport on these. Okay, and one last question is that, uh, do you have some quantitative measures on the twist angle disorder thing? Like you say that there are disorders. Like uh, the quantity store is huge. I, sh I showed you like an STM, like you have maybe like the best sample is at best you have five or six more cells uh, be, uh, be, that are the right angle. Uh, the, the really disorder is huge. And, and there's no way of controlling that, you know, because of the strain and because of, you know, how you put, by the way, if you do CVD graphing, they're much, much more order. If you can, the problem with CVD graphing that you can't control the twist angle, but those are the samples that we looked at back in 2010. They were much, much more ordered. Um, so maybe one final question. Ah, okay, thanks. This online question, um, what is the interplay between the domain walls and the stability of the superconducting phase? Uh, well, so, so as I just said, uh, there is no, if you have a, if you align with boron nitride, there's no superconducting phase. It's somehow that the two are, don't like each other. Now we don't know why, but that's what, you know, that would stimulate, you know, the whole idea of this, the pairing happening in different valleys came from that. So if they happen in different valleys, if you break the valley symmetry, then you don't have superconducting pairing, but we don't know. I mean, uh, and there's no superconductivity in these samples. Good. So I would like to, to thank you again for your very nice talk and the discussion. I would say that we reconvene at 1115 in about half an hour. Yeah, the quick question. So when you resolve different shun bands, like you had this plot where the plot is the density.